So you imagine when things fall apart, one possibility is that they fall into chaos. The other possibility is something like they become hyper conceptualized and hyper orderly. And so then the state itself, which would be the antidote to chaos, actually becomes a source of pathology. And I think that that's what's being hinted at in the story of the Tower of Babel. So here's what happens, is that human beings, I'll read it to you. Um, this, is, this has to do with Noah's descendants. It's, it's a flip into another story. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. Oh, yes. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. New story. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Everybody's getting along fine in their tribal organization, let's say. It's homogenous. They can all speak to one another, and they all speak the same language. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Okay, so what's happening here? There's a guy named... Robin, I think it's Robin Dunbar, and one of the things that Dunbar has done is do a very in detail correlation analysis of cortical expansion and group size, and what he showed is that um, if you if you plot primates by cortical size, let's say you correct it for body size, you plot primates by cortical size, and then you plot the size of their social groups, you see a very tight relationship between the size of the social group and the size of the cortex. The optimal human social group is like 200 individuals, it's something like that, which is maybe roughly the number of people that you can reasonably track on Facebook. After that it's like, well, there's names, but you don't know those people. You're not capable of tracking social dynamics that are any more complex than that, partly because you have other problems to solve. And so one of the things that has been observed is that human groups tend to fractionate if they start to exceed 200. And maybe that's partly because you can't keep track of the complexity. But there's another constraint, which is you want your group to be big enough so that it protects you. But you want it to be small enough so that you can climb to the top. Because, and so when the group gets really, 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 really big, well, maybe it can protect you, although it also doesn't give a damn about you. Like once you're one sixty thousandth of the group, like you are at the University of Toronto, or one thirty millionth of the country, or maybe one three hundred millionth of Europe, which is partly why Europe is going to fragment, because that's just not enough, right? You're just not enough there. The, this, the group is too big. What happens? You keep aggregating the group. It gets more and more powerful, and you can think of that as something that has the capacity to replace the transcendent, right? We'll make a society that's perfect. It's like a utopian vision. That's what I see happening in this story. It's like, we'll make something so great on the part of human beings that it will reach up to heaven itself, which means it will take the place of God. That's what it means. That's exactly what the communists did in Soviet Russia, and that's what they tried to do in, in China, too. And so that's why you ended up with people like Stalin as the God. So you t talk about getting what you deserve. So anyways, so you build these monolithic enterprises. Well, let's call them state enterprises. And the idea there is that the state, the, the hyper-organized and all-inclusive state, can bring about utopia. That's what it means to reach to heaven. So what happens? So God gets wind of that. And he says, God says, uh, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men built. And the Lord said, hmm, behold, the people is one. And now they all have one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and therefore confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Well, it's interesting, because it's sort of, you, the story kind of portrays it as jealousy on God's part, right? It's like, oh, these these human beings, they're, they're building so magnificently that they're starting to challenge my dominion. Well, well I'm going to go down there and play a trick or two on them, and that'll, that'll take care of that. So what happens? The people within the... So the group gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and what happens? It starts to fragment. That is what happens. That's exactly what happens. That's part of the reason why the totalitarian state enterprise to replace the transcendent with structure that's one of the reasons it's doomed. As you pull more and more people in, what happens is you start to pull in chaos itself, and that starts to fragment the order. And so I think 
we're actually in real danger of forgetting this. And one of the things that I saw, read a couple of ominous things. So if you plot the size of economic catastrophes over the last 30 years, they're getting bigger each time. So that's scary. Now, part of that is because the world economy is getting bigger, and so maybe you have to control for that. But the magnitude of the chaos has been increasing with each collapse. Okay. Uh, one of the things that came out of the last collapse, 2008, was the government rescuing collapsed companies like AIG and, and the Royal Bank of Scotland, which by the way was the biggest company in the world no one knows that, but Royal Bank of Scotland collapsed, it was the biggest company in the world and AIG was the insurer of insurers and so it collapsed too, they were rescued by the government and maybe fair enough but one of the motifs that came out of that was the idea of too big to fail well this story says, wait a second it says too big means definite failure, it means inevitable failure and that strikes me as highly probable, is that there's a warning in this story although it's, 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 a, it's a bare story, right, it's only four or five lines, it's just the outlines but it's placed in a very particular place, it's placed right after the flood, right, it's like well there's the nihilistic chaos of the flood and then there's the temp totalitarian temptation to build hyperstructures that can theoretically replace the transcendent well, what happens? You build the hyperstructure and it fragments from within. And then people don't speak the same language and they, and they you know, distribute themselves sort of chaotically on the surface of the earth. So, therefore, is the name of it called Babel? Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Soon afterwards, and I, I think perhaps immediately afterwards, the story of Abraham emerges. And that's really, I would say, that's when the, the prime myths, the primal myths, take on a more historical element. And, and history, you know, roughly speaking, history as we know it begins something like 6,000 years ago. 